I will begin the recording of the meeting and I will give an introduction to Lisa and then turn the time over to her. Dr. Roberts is a certified nurse midwife who has been faculty at the University of Utah since 1993. She has an active clinical practice and enjoys all aspects of women's health care and obstetrics. As a professor in nursing, she is also the Associate Dean of Faculty Practice and is responsible for College of Nursing faculty who are advanced practice nurses, facilitating interdisciplinary models of care and development of new faculty practice sites. Dr. Roberts oversees 13 different faculty practices and is responsible for the 40 faculty in those 13 practices. Her specialty is interdisciplinary and collaborative practice that puts her negotiation skills to the test often. She is the primary author of the Coping with Labor Algorithm, a new tool which replaces the old 1-10 NRS in pain evaluation for the laboring woman. She is also the creative vision behind the Sutter Health College of Nursing Partnership that has led to over 60 graduate assistant positions for the College of Nursing students. Dr. Roberts was the first nurse in Utah to be recognized as a healthcare hero and has received this honor twice. She also received the American Association of Nurse Practitioners State Advocate Award for Excellence in 2013. She is the recipient of the National Perinatal Association's 2013 Individual Contribution to Maternal Child Health Award. She was inducted as a fellow in the American College of Nurse Midwives in 2015. Lisa has also been awarded the Faye W. Whitney School of Nursing 2016 Distinguished Alumni Award from her alma mater, the University of Wyoming, just this past week. With that introduction, we'd like to turn the time over to Lisa Roberts. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you. And can you just confirm that you can hear me okay? I can hear you fine. Thank you. All right, great. So just to let those of you in the audience know, um, since I'm presenting and sharing my screen, I'm not able to see your questions and if you raise your hand or have any comments right now. So I'm not choosing to ignore you. I just can't tell that you're, um, that you have anything to say. And as indicated, we'll take all the questions at the end of this presentation. I also want to let you know that the slide presentation is about 78 slides. I was thinking we had 90 minutes. I think we only have 60. So I'm going to blaze through the back half of this and get to the questions because you don't need me to read the information to you. Um, but I also want to say thank you so much for having me today. I'm really excited to be able to present and talk with you guys. I think you're doing some fabulous work. So let's get into the objectives of the session. So at the conclusion of this session, I hope that you can articulate the original intent of the Joint Commission standard and verbalize alternatives to the 1 through 10 numeric rating scale. I also hope that you'll be able to describe a total quality management or TQM process improvement tool that can help to implement an alternative pain measurement tool or implement almost anything in the hospital that you want to create change around. I also hope that you'll be able to um, articulate how the coping with labor algorithm can help support vaginal birth and reduce primary cesarean sections. So as we go through here, I'm going to talk about why we developed the coping algorithm. We're going to talk about um, pain and the definition of pain, the two divergent pain models, the Joint Commission Standard. We'll discuss the theoretical framework that we use to create the algorithm and uh, create change within our own facility. A little bit of time on electronic charting. The evidence, I'm pretty much going to skip, but you all are going to be able to read that yourself. And then we're going to talk about the advantages and a little bit about what you all are doing um, in California. So the purpose of this original project was to develop and implement a pain assessment, documentation, and management tool that was unique to the laboring patient and replace the 0 through 10 numeric rating scale. As we began to explore this, we had to ask ourselves some different questions. What is pain? Can all pain be rated? Is all pain bad? And can you have pain without suffering? 
Pain is defined by the International Association and the American Pain Society as an unpleasant sensory and emotional experience associated with actual or potential tissue damage and described in terms of such damage. To me, this definition of pain sounds worse than what pain really is. Um, and as we know, perceptions of pain can be influenced by social and environmental factors, as well as a person's experiences and cultural factors. So we know that the pain of labor and childbirth is not easily defined, nor is it always simple to assess, because women do express pain in different ways depending upon what culture they come from. Childbirth pain can either be celebrated or vilified, again, depending on a woman's personal experience, cultural models, and expectations. And because of the multiple factors that influence pain and a woman's perception of pain during labor, assessing pain accurately in clinical practice can be challenging and certainly can be very difficult if you're only allowed to use a numeric system. So the way pain is experienced is a reflection of the individual's emotional, motivational, cognitive, social, and cultural circumstances. The pain of childbirth is likely to be some of the most severe pain that a woman might experience during her lifetime. Many women, especially Nola Perez, rate the pain of labor as very severe or intolerable. The pain of labor and delivery varies among women, and each woman and each individual labor can be quite different. As you guys know, someone with an abnormal fetal presentation, a brow, a face, an occiput posterior can be associated with more severe pain and may be present in one pregnancy but not present in the next pregnancy. So every time we experience pain and labor pain, it can be perceived very differently. Labor pain is really the result of a lot of complex interactions. And though, although it's not really fully determined, the pain arises from the distension of the lower uterine segment and also from cervical dilation. The neural mechanism of pain has some features similar to other forms of acute pain. Within the first stage of labor, pain is a result of the mechanical distension of the lower uterine segment and cervical dilation. That's transmitted through the nerve and root ganglia of T10 to L1. In the late first stage and into the second stage, Pain is the result of somatic pain from the distension and traction of the pelvic structures and the distension of the pelvic floor and perineum. That's transmitted through the pudental nerve and through the anterior rami of S2 to S4. So now that we know just a little bit about uterine pain, where it comes from, what it's the result of, let's take a look at the different models. So there are two divergent models for pain relief, pharmacologic models and non-pharmacologic models. The pharmacologic model, their desire is to eliminate or minimize the pain of a woman and what she's feeling in labor, while the non-pharmacologic model offers resources for effective coping during the labor and birth experience. Simkin and Bolding refer to these as the medical and midwifery model, I'm, I like the pharmacologic and non-pharmacologic model um, a little bit better. So the pharmacologic model tends to view pain as pathologic, and the elimination of pain sensation is its full emphasis. So in taking a look at that medical model, we sort of all know what that entails. Most of us think epidural when we think about the, um, when we think about the medical model. The caption on this particular picture, I'm going to read it to you. It says, your understanding of what happens during labor and delivery, as well as your attitude toward it, affect the amount of pain you feel while giving birth. The breathing methods and relaxation techniques you learn in childbirth education classes may reduce your need for pain medication, but you won't know whether you'll need drugs until you're in the delivery room. 
The most common form of pain medication used in labor and delivery is an epidural block. During the procedure, anesthetic is injected into the epidural space near your spinal cord, temporarily numbing your lower body. Then the next picture and its caption says, the major benefit of having an epidural is that you can remain awake, alert, and almost totally pain-free while you actively participate in your baby's birth. You can also relax and conserve your energy during a long labor. To lower your odds of side effects for you and your baby, your doctor will likely give you the lowest effective dose. Well, if you were a Nola Paris woman and you came across this and read it, it would sound wonderful. Um, but, you know, being what I feel like is paternalistic is not necessarily always the way to go. Um, and as you can see on this slide that's up right now, the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecologists, this is their um, 2006 compendium. And they're really promoting, too, that we should offer pain management. And I think we should offer pain management, but I also think we should not be paternalistic and we should respect what it is that a woman wants. So acceptance of the model mandates a pharmacologic response to labor pain in women and tends towards the use of analgesics and regional anesthesia to either minimize or eliminate labor pain. This is a quote from fellow nurse midwife Nancy Lowe. This is from her 2002 article. And I think that this quote really sums up the problem of using a 0 through 10 numeric rating scale in labor. This kind of gets to the heart of that question that we had asked earlier. Is all pain bad? And can you have pain without suffering? And I think the answer is no, not all pain is bad, and you can have pain without suffering. Childbirth is one of those things that is so amazing, and women want to work through that. They want to be able to cope with it to get to the other side and to get to this point here that's in this picture. This is one of my previous colleagues, um, Lisa, and she is now at uh, Case Western. We miss her dearly, but that is her beautiful face delivering a baby. So the non-pharmacologic model views the pain of childbirth as physiologic and focuses really on the elimination of suffering. The American College of Nurse Midwives issued a philosophy statement which says that women have the right to self-determination to complete information and to active participation in all aspects of her care within the bounds of safety. So whether a couple's planning on a medicated or an unmedicated birth, relaxation, preparation, knowledge are all essential for a positive birth experiences. And as maternal care providers, we all know that the sight, the sound, the taste, the smell, the touch, and a host of other factors really enter into play when a woman labors. We encourage a non-pharmacologic method of pain relief, and we want people to be prepared. We'd like them to be able to have everything at their disposal. So we've talked about the pharmacologic and the non-pharmacologic, so we're going to take a look at the Aztec model of pain relief. And this is sort of just a fun model. I think you all can probably read this, but it says, the Hichol Indians are descendants of the Aztecs and live in the mountains of north central Mexico. During traditional childbirth, the father sits above his laboring wife on the roof of their hut. Ropes are tied around his testicles and his wife holds on to the other ends. Each time she feels a painful contraction, she tugs on the ropes so that her husband will share some of the pain of their child's entrance into the world. So that's just kind of fun. But all kidding aside, as we went through the research process and we wrestle, wrestled with those questions, can all pain be rated, we realized that the 0 through 10 scale was not working. Yet we also knew that we needed to be compliant with the JACO standard and assess a woman's labor pain and make it meaningful to both the woman and the nurse. Is all pain bad? Well, labor pain is physiologic, 
and it's the process that results in the birth of the baby. The degree of perceived pain is individual to each woman. Can you have pain without suffering? Well, Lowe has identified that when an individual is confident that they can cope with the challenge of a supposed threat, and many people would say that um, if you feel that you can cope with the challenge of childbirth, that it can result in exhilaration rather than in suffering. And I think we've all seen that in our own practices. Conversely, when a woman doesn't have sufficient resources to be able to cope with her labor sensations, she might actually feel helpless, and suffering may be the result of that, which is why preparation is so key for women. And then lastly, why do we care about pain? Well, we care about pain because Jayco tells us to care about pain, but really, firstly, we care about that because we're compassionate people and we're in a healing profession. So the physiologic process of labor and birth is, is really mediated by multiple hormones and hormonal responses that can be very easily disrupted. The natural increases in epinephrine, norepinephrine, cortisol, and oxytocin that occur in labor can really be mediated by that physical environment and definitely mediated by the fear, tension, stress, cycle that many of you have probably seen in some of your studies. And I think one of the things that can be helpful to this is being able to mediate that environment. So designing a labor and delivery environment that can identify barriers and can really support the intention of vaginal birth with minimal uh, distraction and with maximal support. So incorporating women's ability to move, having position changes, making sure that women are not immobilized can all allow and facilitate for flexion, rotation, and descent to provide for the birth of the baby. Now we're going to talk a little bit about Joint Commission. So the Joint Commission is an organization that accredits hospitals. DNV is also an organization that accredits hospitals. Both of them have developed standards that the hospital has to follow in order to maintain their accreditation. And the standards are around pain management. JACO first developed these in 1999. And um, the reason they did this was that they wanted to ensure that the staff was competent to assess pain and also to document that pain response. They wanted to make sure that pain was being assessed on an ongoing basis for all patients. And the reason that they implemented this was because there was a failure on the part of healthcare professionals to properly care for and to manage a person's pain experience when they had a significant injury and particularly when they had surgery. So these standards were developed around orthopedic surgery because what Jayco found was that a lot of orthopedic patients did not have appropriate pain management while they were in the hospital. And they came up with the 0 through 10 non-numeric uh, rating scale in order to say, hey, look, this is one way that you can do this. The difficulty is that when Jayco came up with this, they didn't ever intend for this to be sort of a dictate that everyone had to use the 0 through 10 numeric rating scale. In fact, the standard actually reads that patients have a right to pain management. And the justification behind this is that the organization should plan, support, and coordinate activities and resources to ensure that pain is recognized and addressed appropriately and in accordance with the care, treatment, and services provided. So we need to make sure that we assess pain, educate all the relevant providers about pain assessment and management, and also educate patients and families. We cannot forget that our patients and our families are a part of this. 
Next, they say that a hospital should define in writing the data and information gathered during the assessment and reassessment. The justification behind this reads that if applicable, a separate specialized assessment and reassessment information is identified for various populations served. And they wrote this in there because they knew that the 0 through 10 scale was not necessarily going to meet the needs of every single patient population within the hospital. But as with all things, I think that institutions scramble when, when something's put into place and we're said we're going to be held to a standard. We all scramble to figure out how are we going to meet that standard. Um, so in order to maintain the Joint Commission compliance and to meet patients' needs, we developed the coping with labor algorithm to replace the numeric rating scale. Um, so as you look at this, you can see that JACO really never intended um, that the 0 through 10 be used for the laboring woman. So prior to implementing, implementing the coping with labor algorithm on our labor and delivery unit, we had to um, recognize what joint commission meant, and we also had to realize that it's difficult to actually quantify the pain of labor. So like the rest of the nation, we were scrambling and we said, all right, let's take a look at this and figure out what we can do. So we know that a lot of patients are asking not to have their pain score recorded. They're also will ask, why are you asking me this? It's very difficult to understand. They're confused as to whether they should rate their pain with a contraction or between a, contra in between a contraction. So while the pain, pain score was meant to convey a sense of concern and an intent to help a patient manage their pain, many nurses felt like patients were really just confused or annoyed by the ongoing questioning and especially if you have to ask it every hour or whatever it is that your institution says. Some people are able to get away with asking it once a shift, which I think is great. Um, but we really recognized it was a huge problem. So although lower levels of pain have been correlated with higher levels of childbirth satisfaction, it's interesting to note that higher levels of pain don't preclude overall satisfaction with a childbirth experience. So when interviewed after labor and delivery, mothers tend to downplay the intensity of their labor pain. It's not the most important factor influencing satisfaction with a childbirth experience. However, having a sense of personal control over their decision-making processes in labor has consistently been shown to correlate with overall maternal satisfaction. For example, a study of 60 women who delivered vaginally found that personal control predicted greater maternal satisfaction. Another study of 100 women undergoing vaginal delivery reported that satisfaction with pain relief was associated with the feeling of being in control and having input into the decision-making process. These findings suggest that women should be involved in the decision-making process regarding all aspects of their childbirth, including their pain relief, in order to increase maternal uh, satisfaction. This can be accomplished by educating women about pain relief techniques during pregnancy prior to the onset of labor so that women can carefully contemplate their options before labor commences. Because once you're in labor, it's a little bit too late to really understand how you can cope and deal with what's going on. So as we looked at this, and this is a, um, this is a quote from Winnie the Pooh. Most of you probably recognize this. Here is Edward Bear coming downstairs now, bump, bump, bump on the back of his head behind Christopher Robin. 
It is, as far as he knows, the only way of coming downstairs, but sometimes he feels that there really is another way. If only he could stop bumping for a moment to think of it. So like Winnie the Pooh, we felt there really must be another way. And after bumping up against that lack of fit for the numerical rating scale, we took a moment to think about that new way. A new way to document that nurses were appropriately assessing, reassessing, and documenting the needs of laboring women. So we used um, the total, our objective was to evaluate that alternative method for coping with the experience of labor. And we used a total quality management TQM process that focused on Edward Deming's PDCA and a focus framework. And I'm gonna talk a little bit more about what those are. And there's that blank slide I have in there, so sorry about that. Um, so the focus framework, and by the way, we did seek um, IRB approval for this, and we were granted an exemption based on the fact that this was a process improvement um, project. So the standard practice at University Hospital is to use the focus format, and there are many, many hospitals that use focus format. This was um, adopted by the Hospital Corporation of America in 1988. That's a long time ago, but it's still a very proven process improvement strategy. Um, so finding a process to improve, organizing the team, clarifying the current knowledge, understanding the causes of process variation, and selecting the process improvement. And then the PDCA, Edward Deming, um, this is a total quality management that was really developed in the early 1990s. Um, I, I'm sorry, it was developed in the early 1950s and it spread to healthcare in the early 1990s. And I'm sure most of you are fairly familiar with this as well. So this is an outline of the focus format. Find the improvement. Our improvement was to improve pain assessment for laboring women. Organizing a team. We had six RNs and one CNM. We all joined together to create this change. Clarifying the knowledge. We performed a literature review. We've talked a little bit about what we found in that literature review, including patient, patient satisfaction and whether or not pain management affects that understanding the causes of process variation, and um, all of our team members had at least 10 years of experience, and that added value to understanding the process of labor and selecting the process improvement. And of course, ours was to find that alternative. This is the PDA cycle. And Deming's PDA cycle is typically in a circle, and I'm gonna show you a different one that I've developed as I've been working with a lot of different um, hospitals and teams to implement the coping with labor algorithm. But this is the first one we used. Um, so the members of the task force, those original seven members, after we did our literature review and we came up with the coping algorithm, we implemented that over a two week time frame. It was only the task force members that implemented it and we used the algorithm and the numerical rating scale at the same time while we were caring for laboring women. So we conducted ongoing communication back and forth about how the algorithm was received. Um, we discussed the user's perspectives on whether they felt it was effective and easy to use and we sort of kept tweaking and changing it during those two weeks. After those two weeks and we felt like we could drop the numeric rating scale and we could just go with the algorithm. So then we rolled it out to the rest of the team. And I'm going to talk a little bit about a little bit more in a minute here about what that looked like. But I want to go back to that literature review, review that I was talking about and I want to talk about why we came up with coping rather than comfort. And um, coping and comfort are both used, and I think they're both great terms, but I think they mean different things. So coping is a complex and multidimensional phenomenon that's been found to have cognitive, emotional, and behavioral qualities. 
And we know that all of those things are absolutely true about laboring women. Coping is also defined as a stress-specific specific pattern by which an individual's perceptions, emotions, and behaviors prepare for adapting and changing. Whereas comfort has a little bit different definition. And Abishaki in 2007 also found that effectively coping in labor has been linked to lower levels of pain, more self-confidence, more maternal childbirth satisfaction, and more positive labor outcomes. And all of those are things that we want to see. So going back to that PDCA, micro, uh, PDCA model, as we continued the process. So we launched this. We used it for six weeks. Then we tweaked it again, and we used it for six months. So we surveyed our core group of nurses and all of our staff. We surveyed them at six weeks and at six months. So that's the do part of the improvement. And then the check part of the improvement is where we went in for the assessments, and I'm going to talk about those in a minute. So that's the PDC, and then the A is Act to Maintain. So we had our core group on labor and delivery. Our feedback was incorporated. We rolled it out to all labor and delivery staff, and then we had our evaluation of our five yes-no questions, and we also allowed an opportunity for some open-ended elaboration on our questions. We, during this time, we also created a guideline for our labor and delivery nurses. And in creating this guideline, and, and I'll show you when we get to my next PDCI cycle, I'll show you where all of this in, is incorporated into it. Um, but, you know, the goal was to really determine appropriate care, treatment, and services to meet the patient's initial needs as well as their changing needs on the labor and delivery unit. And we really had to describe our philosophy of pain care. We had to recognize the uniqueness of the laboring population. So we needed to define the vocabulary used for documentation purposes. We had to define when the coping hour rhythm is used. And we had to define the frequency of assessment and when to transition to the 1 through 10 numeric scale or when it should be implemented. And just to note, a lot of people will um, ask me, well, what if a woman comes in and she has a migraine? Or what if a woman has back pain at the same time? So you can use the coping with labor algorithm simultaneously to using the numeric rating scale for some other acute type of pain. And it actually works well. Women understand it. There, there's no confusion at all for them that they're using a 0 through 10 or a 1 through 10 scale to rate what's going on with their acute back pain or to maybe rate what's going on with their migraine. And they're using um, a coping algorithm to say, yes or no, I'm coping with my labor. So I'm going to go into um, looking at what our charting looks like next. So we used OB TraceView when we started this. And I think the interesting thing about when we started our process, electronic medical record was really moving from the outpatient system into the inpatient system, plus it was sort of right at the beginning of the adoption of electronic electronic medical records by everyone. Um, I think that this interfered a little bit in the adoption of the coping with labor algorithm in some institutions, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later. But for our charting, we were originally using um, Phillips OB TraceView. And this is Valerie. I just wanted to give you a time check. We're at 105. Okay, thank you. Uh -huh. um, so 
As we look at the patient response, we use CW for coping well at this point in time. In Tracy, we could just go in and click this coping, not coping, or no complaints of pain button, and that would record it on the monitor strip. But now that we've moved into Epic, we use CW for coping well and NC for not coping. So this enabled us to look at the patient response. We could do a pain assessment, talk about what type of pain it was. We could talk about the pain location. Pain assessment. We could talk about non-pharmacologic interventions. What did we use? The one thing that I really liked about this is that it enabled us to go back and have a record of what type of intervention was really used with the patient. And I feel like we don't record that very well at this point in time. So these are the results of our survey from uh, 2005. When we asked the question, is the coping, not coping algorithm beneficial to the patient, 100% of our respondents said yes, that it was. Does it provide a better assessment than the non-numeric, than the numeric rating scale? In July, 95% said yes. In December, 100% said yes. The 95% in July was because there was some confusion about how to document if a patient said she was coping, but the nurse felt she was showing signs of not coping. So we provided education for, for the nurses around that as a result of that question. And for those of you who work with different cultures, in many cultures you know that screaming or making loud noises or moaning very loudly is an effective coping mechanism culturally for that person. Whereas for us, we feel like if someone is screaming, that must mean that, well, they're not coping very well. So, you know, we, we have to keep in mind that we're not the ones to judge whether or not a person's coping. They know if they are or they are not. Um, so do you feel the new coping algorithm is an improvement in pain assessment? And 100% of nurses felt like it was at both times. So these are some of the quotes from the labor and delivery nurses. Um, and these quotes are underneath what we call a qualitative analysis. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about that here in just a second. So um, in our qualitative analysis, we analyzed all the quotes, we pulled out the important words, and we discovered the themes. So there were 82 comments that we analyzed. And when we analyzed those, we had um, 50 primary codes, nine secondary codes, and three themes emerged. And this is, um, this is a qualitative analysis rather than um, a quantitative analysis. So it's not numbers, it's words. And I apologize for all the fanciness here. Um, I've tried to take this off the slide numerous times and I can't get it to come off. So those are the primary codes and you can take a look at those. These are the secondary codes, which I think are pretty interesting. Um, these are the things that nurses felt like the coping with labor algorithm allowed them to see and understand. And then the themes that emerged were coping, process, and communication, all of the things that surround labor when women are laboring. This was implemented um, at Washington State um, in a community hospital and an urban hospital. Robin Gibson was uh, working on a master's degree in May of 2011. She used a convenience sample. She used two labor and delivery units in a five hospital system and trialed the coping with labor algorithm for two weeks there. Um, at the community hospital, they received their training on a poster board, whereas at the urban hospital, they received hands-on training. And I'm going to let you know a little bit later that I'm not so sure the training actually makes a difference. So for her respondents, coping, not coping, beneficial, 100% said yes. Does it provide a better assessment than the numeric rating scale? 79% said yes, which I found interesting. And as we looked at the no comments, one person said that she just wasn't sure if it did or not. And then another person said that it didn't help her assess better, 
but she felt it did help her describe her assessment better. So I, I'm going to take that as a win because I think that that's probably semantics. This is another graduate student, Esther Fairchild, and she was at um, Baylor University in Dallas, Texas. And she was implementing the algorithm using the Demings PDCA and a stakeholder theory. And they used a voiceover PowerPoint for their training. And they trained all of their RN staff, which is over 80 people, over a four-week time frame. And in her survey, this is what they found, that 96% felt that, yes, it was beneficial. 92% felt it was a better assessment. Um, and in that first one there, the dissenting person who didn't feel it was beneficial, the reason she said it wasn't is because it seemed like we already assessed these things along with the pain assessment. So she didn't feel like she necessarily needed the coping with the labor algorithm to tell her she'd, she should be assessing those things. Um, on the second one, the dissenting person said that there's so much to assess that she wasn't able to really focus on the usefulness of it. And on the third one, one of the dissenting people said that no, they didn't feel like it was helpful because every labor nurse is different in how they assess pain and coping. So it's sort of interesting to me um, the different results that we get, but by and large, I think we've got um, some pretty nice wins on here. So this is going to be one of the tools that um, they're going to put up for you guys to be able to use. So I've had over 300 in inquiries um, about initiating the coping with labor algorithm in different facilities and hospitals. and. Um, it's also been utilized in Canada to reduce primary cesarean sections rates. They've been using it in Canada now for about seven or eight years. Um, it's being used in Mexico, India, um, Denmark, Finland, uh, France. It's been translated into Spanish, um, French, Danish. Um, it's being used over in Saudi Arabia. And so um, it, it's kind of, it's gone, it's gone wild, let's put it that way. But in looking at that PDCA, when we first did it, we didn't have near the knowledge that we have right now. So this gives you an 11 step process to really look at this. So number one, when you're planning, you need to identify key administrators that can grant permission to implement the coping with labor algorithm. Whether that's your medical director, your nurse manager, nursing administration, it might even be your pain committee. Some hospitals have pain committees that are the ones that say, this is what we're going to use in our hospital. So it's like, which, which hoop do you have to jump through? And then we usually recommend forming a team or identifying stakeholders. And when you do that, it's important not to forget your information technology folks. Um, not to forget your electronic medical record people. And as you're looking at this and you're involving people, it's important to make sure that your key decision points also include money. So I need to go back and revise this and put a dollar sign in there somewhere. Because you do need to think about policy, practice change, culture, charting, but you've also got to think about money. Is it too expensive to be able to implement this does your elect electronic medical record have to be changed so much? And I'm going to say that most of the institutions that have been successful haven't had any difficulty, and it hasn't really cost them any money to, to make the modifications that they need in their EMR. Um, I'm getting just a little bit worried about time here. So you guys can read this. I've also got my... Um, email address on the Coping with Labor algorithm, which is going to be put up uh, for you guys to access as well, please feel free to email me if you have any questions. And really, this is what it's all about. We're here to make the birthing experience for women everything that they want it to be. 
we know the women who come in with the five-page birthing plans and we all just go, oh my gosh. Um, but whether they have a five-page or no birthing plan, we're here to help them cope with their labor. And then this is just a slide of the coping with labor algorithm, but you should have a PDF of this as well that you can use. And then I'm going to just talk with you a little bit about some of the new data that I've just um, recently looked at. I haven't written about it or anything. But this is a survey that I sent called Assessing Barriers to the Successful Implementation of the Coping with Labor Algorithm in the Labor and Delivery Organizational Environment. So I've had over 300 requests for people to implement. I sent a survey out to 265 per participants. 90 of the emails got returned back to me and it was like, okay, these people are no longer available. So 175 were successfully sent or delivered as far as I know. I had 44 surveys returned, three of those were incomplete. Out of those, 56% had implemented the coping with labor algorithm and 44% had not implemented. So in looking at successful implementation, most people want to know, what's the thing that I have to have? So the most successful educational strategies seem to be training at staff meetings. And we did, when we asked the questions, we asked what was the most successful, second most, third most, and fourth most. Um, so training at staff meetings, poster boards, and PowerPoint presentations all seem to be pretty successful. Required readings, not so much. Now this is what's interesting. If you look at this results on a bar graph, there is not a single thing that jumps out at you. The purple may be a little bit. Purple is the most successful. So some people said training at staff meeting. Some people said the PowerPoint. Some people said the staff championship. So all of those things, somewhere along the line, somebody felt like that was the most successful to them. When we looked at barriers, the biggest barrier was the electronic record documentation. And again, this came out at a time when hospitals were just transitioning to an electronic medical record, and when labor and delivery units champions came to them and said, hey, this is so cool and we want to implement this, Many times there was pushback about that because the whole thing was so new, people just didn't have the bandwidth to say, yes, we can do one more thing just special for you. So biggest was the electronic record documentation. Documentation concerns of how do you chart in a new way. And then the third biggest was a tie between organizational climate and organizational capacity for change. That capacity for change is a lack of management support, lack of nursing support, lack of a champion, whatever it might be. For one particular hospital, it was because they were moving a unit that um, I think they do about 8,000 births a year. They were moving to a brand new hospital. So of course I understand why their management said, we're absolutely not going to do this right now. And again, this is what's interesting. If you look at this, you can see that the barriers are all over the place. There is not one thing that absolutely sticks out. So the one thing that I want you all to realize from this is that there are really no barriers and there is no magic trick that's going to make it possible for you to implement the coping with labor algorithm. It's sort of like just a toss of a coin. If you have the patience and the persistence, you are going to be able to make this happen. So if you want to do it, I'm going to say just go for it. So this is part two, looking at the evidence. And we're not going to look at the evidence. Um, I want you all to look at the grading of the evidence because the one thing about the coping with labor algorithm is that it does say whether or not the evidence is sufficient, insufficient, or whether or not um, there's no harm. So this goes through every single um, care, uh, 
care management technique that's on the coping with labor algorithm. And as I said, you guys are going to have these, so you're going to be able to take a look at them. So I think we should just jump right into questions and use the remaining time for that. Does that, does that sound good? Yeah, that sounds really good, Lisa. Thank you so much for that great presentation. We only have a couple questions at this point in time. The first one is, how do you incorporate the algorithm into your orders for pain medications? We currently use the numeric system, i.e. 1 through 6, Nubane 10 milligrams SQ, or 7 to 10 Nubane 10 milligrams SQ, and Nubane 10 milligrams IVP. Um, so how do, so they, how do they incorporate the algorithm into the orders for the pain medication, or do they? I, I don't think the use of the coping with labor algorithm is, um, it's not an order that you would receive from a physician. Um, all of the care and the care measures that are on the coping with labor algorithm are well, except for those that need orders like an epidural or IV pain medication. Um, so you, you just follow the normal procedures that you have within your hospital, but using the coping algorithm should be a nursing decision. And if, you, and if in your hospital you need an order for any of the care measures on the algorithm, then you should just get that order the same way that you usually do. I don't know if that makes, I hope that makes sense to you. Okay, so the next, um, the next question was, um, I'm very concerned regarding the latest article regarding laboring down. I have been caring for women in labor and birth, and I actually found a bunch more questions, so there are a few more that we need to cover. Um, I've been caring for women in labor and birth and education. Please address this as I feel it was one of the best interventions. I'm not sure what article she's referring to. Um, I am not sure what article you're referring to either. Okay. So we'll go on. Um, um, to the next question. You may have answered the, you may answer this, has TJC, A1, or ACOG embraced, um, and she doesn't say what she's embracing. It, this is a wonderful how the MDs are such a barrier. I, oh, she's talking about this coping algorithm. Um, I travel the U.S. and so many nurses are so frustrated with everything. How do we get buy-in? So I, I think that you get buy-in um, using that, the very last um, PDCA that I put up there, the one that has the 11 steps. I think you need to understand your organizational climate. You need to understand who are the decision makers in your organization. And those are the folks that you need to get on your side. Um, you need to have a champion and an advocate. And if that can, if you're the champion and the advocate, then that's wonderful. If you're not that person, then look and see who that person is. And keep in mind that those folks are not always formal leaders. They can also be informal leaders. Um, but there's enough evidence out there to um, show that this, that this is valuable for women. And I think using, um, if you look on, so using the tools that are on, the, on your California Quality uh, website, and you guys have got a great article on there. I can't remember which one it is here. I think I've got it. It's part two, um, recognition and prevention, supporting intended vaginal birth. But then also going on to the American College of Nurse, Nurse Midwives website and looking at healthy birth initiatives. And there, they have some bundles on there for reducing primary cesarean section rates. And if you look at all of those bundles, each bundle will go through what's called readiness, risk assessment, risk and appropriate assessment, reliable delivery, recognition response, and reporting. And 
bundle talk and bundle discussion, I think, is something that most quality people in hospitals recognize at this point in time. So get on that website and take a look at some of the bundles and do your homework. And then please feel free to email me and I'll, I will try to help you out as well. So the next question is, um, how does this work for abruption? Uh, well, I mean, I, I'm going to say that once you recognize an abruption, you're done coping in labor because you're probably going straight back for a cesarean section. So any time there's an urgent or an emergent need on labor and delivery, such, um, such as an abruption or the need for an emergent cesarean section, then you're done assessing whether a patient's coping in labor or not, and you're moving into emergency mode. And you just follow your institutional policies, procedures, and guidelines to make sure that that patient gets the care that they need as timely and as quickly as possible so that you have a quality outcome. So the next question is, if the patient is not coping with labor and wants medical intervention, do you then shift to the pain scale so that you can implement pain medication orders that are tied to the numeric pain scale? Uh, no, you don't need to. So um, you don't have to go to the pain scale when you give um, fentanyl, or I think someone gave an example of Nubane earlier, um, or when you use an epidural, you can continue to use the coping with labor algorithm. So what you do is you create your pain assessment. You say the, the patient's not coping. Your intervention is an epidural. And then you go back in your reassessment and you say the patient is coping well. But you don't need to go to the um, 1 through 10 numeric rating scale. Okay, the next question is, is there any patient satisfaction data regarding satisfaction with pain management before and after the implementation of the tool? No, and the reason for that is, um, when many people see the tool, they think that the tool is aimed at the patient because it's really aimed at helping the patient to cope in labor. But the tool is really for nurses. So the tool is so that nurses can have a guide for the assessment, reassessment, and documentation of how a woman is coping in labor or how a woman is dealing with her pain in labor. The tool isn't necessarily meant for patient satisfaction. If you move to the tool, you might actually increase your patient satisfaction, and you might increase your normal spontaneous vaginal birth rate, but there has to be a whole lot more in place aside from moving to the tool. There's got to be, there's got to be a cultural change that happens as well. Thank you, Lisa. We have about three questions left, and I know we're very close to 1.30. Um, I would like to go ahead and just address those three questions real quickly, if that's okay. Sure. Um, the next question is, um, there is a, a nurse who's um, been using the Defense and Veterans Pain Rating Scale at their hospital. It's their standard. They're not sure it's been validated for the labor patient. Um, is there any information on this scale and how it compares to the coping with labor algorithm? I don't believe that there are any comparisons to um, that particular pain scale. And I, I am not familiar with that either. Okay. I would love it if you would email me that so I can take a look at it. Okay, and for that question, for that person who asked that question, that was Ramona Hunter. You can send it in the chat box real quick before the meeting ends, and then I will get it and send it to Lisa, or, or you can send it to her directly. Um, there was a facility in Abu Dhabi, Abu Dhabi who um, received approval to implement the, the coping algorithm. Have you heard whether they were able to um, do so? Have you worked with them, Lisa? You know, I've worked with her and I talked with her over the phone and then the last time that I sent her an email to see how they are doing, I did not get an email back from her. So I'm not so sure. 
Okay. If they were able to to um, implement or not. Okay. Um, the article that was um, being referred to earlier was a retrospective analysis in which there was not a standardization of initiatives. The strength of the article is not the same as the strength of the randomized control trials. Laboring down is still the standard of care. So that's a comment. Um, and um, then the last comment, really not a question, is um, that the coping with labor algorithm is very important to A1's maternal fetal triage index. So it is important that L&D RNs consider adopting this. So that was a comment from Susan Garpiel. So that yes. all of the questions that we've received um, yeah. to date, and we are at time. Any last thoughts you'd like to share, Lisa? Yeah, I do just want to let, so the person who asked about the defense and veterans pain rating scale, I'm, I'm not really sure what that is, but I do want to let you all know that um, the Department of Defense did adopt the coping with labor algorithm and has asked permission to use it for all branches of the military. Um, and that's been about four or five years ago. So. Kaiser has adopted it, um, the DODs adopted it for um, all of the branches of the military. There's been a lot of adoption that I think has just been wonderful. And then one last thing, I'm doing a um, Delphi study right at the moment. If any of you want to participate in it, you could send me an email and I'm happy to send you the study. The purpose of the Delphi study is to create some validation expert validation on the coping with labor algorithm. And it's also to create a childbirth satisfaction survey tool that will be able to begin to pull out whether women intended to use a certain care measure, care measure and whether they did use a care measure and if they felt that helped them cope. Because for so many things that we feel like work, we don't have the evidence to prove that they do work. So I'm trying to create a tool that will enable us to gain evidence about uh, position changes and aromatherapy, music therapy, massage, pressure points, all the things that we feel like we've seen work with our patients one-on-one um, -on -one in our day-to-day -day lives. And I want to thank you so much for giving me this opportunity. Well, thank you, Lisa. We really appreciate you being willing to present to um, everyone who really wants to help women um, labor and do a better job and have better outcomes. Um, for those of you who are still on the call, the slides and the algorithms will be posted on the CMQCC website. I will try to get them up tomorrow, which is Wednesday. And if you have any questions, you can give our, call, our office contact. Um, you can call us or send an email to us and at CMQCC and appreciate everyone's attention and um, questions and thank you so much. Take care. Have a great afternoon. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Catherine, are you okay if I hang up now? <laughs>